ladies and gentlemen. Buenos dias. Good morning. Thank you very much for attending this uh, table called uh, Entrepreneurial Trends. And you're very welcome. My name is Carlos Morales. I am a lecturer in EADA Business School in Barcelona. And it's my very pleasure to introduce you our two speakers this morning. Uh, Dennis Crowley. Dennis. Thank you very much. Dennis is co-founder of Foursquare, a service that mixes social, locative, and gaming elements to encourage people to explore the cities in which they live. And previously, Dennis founded Dog, uh, Dodgeball.com, one of the first mobile social services in the US, which was acquired by Google in 2005. Dennis is currently, as well, an adjunct professor in New York's Interactive Telecommunications program. Dennis. Um, our second speaker is Dave McClure. Dave, you're welcome. Dave is a Silicon Valley tech entrepreneur, startup investor, and blogger. Dave is an investor in over 30 startup companies, including Mint, acquired by Intuit. Uh, from 2001 to 2004, Dave was the director of marketing at, at PayPal, acquired later by eBay in 2002, where he started and ran the PayPal Developer Network program. In 1994, he founded Aslan Computing, and internet and e-commerce uh, e firms later acquired by Servinet Pagorne in 1988. Okay? Um, have a nice uh, conference, Hi, have a nice table, have a nice <laughs> hit Barcelona. Bye. <laughs> okay, so uh, Dennis, uh, we're going to get right into it here. <laughs> Uh, just, just to clear the air, uh, the company I've worked for, Founders Fund, is an investor and a competitor to Foursquare called Gowala, but I will try not to be uh, overly combative it doesn't during mean this we interview. can't be friends. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, Dennis, I wrote a rather critical post of Foursquare uh, check-ins, uh, just check-in industry in general, a few months ago. Months ago. Uh, we'll get into that later, but can you tell us uh, a little bit about sort of what your background uh, as an entrepreneur and a geek has been? Uh, and sort of how did you get started with becoming uh, an entrepreneur? Yeah, sure. So I think I ended up um, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur by accident. Um, you know, I've been in New York about 10 years, and I hopped around to a couple different startups. And, you know, I got laid off once, and I ended up going back to grad school. Um, but, you know, the, the, I think the, the reason I ended up doing some of the dodgeball stuff and some of the Foursquare stuff is because I couldn't find the companies that I wanted to work for, and I couldn't find the products that I wanted to work on. Like, no one was building the things specifically that I wanted to use, and, that they, and really the, the things that I wanted to work on day to day. And the theory was, just, so I guess you just build them yourselves. And so you know, through grad school and working on the dodgeball stuff, we never intended for that to be a company. Um, and then we, you know, we eventually grew to the point where we sold it to, to Google. Um, with Foursquare, it kind of grew to the point where you sold to Google. That's that was not a minor event. It, well, no, I, think, I mean, right? but it was all, we were also a two-person startup at the time. You okay. Know? So it wasn't that wasn't in the plan. The so plan that's, was that's pretty fucking cool. You got acquired by Google. Uh, yeah, it was first company. It was a, a fun experience, right? Yeah. Um, no, but same thing with Foursquare. Like Foursquare was not supposed to be a company. It was supposed to be, you know, hey, Google turned dodgeball off, and we still want to use this, so let's rebuild it. And okay. we didn't realize that it would turn into, you know, what, what it is right now. So you, you started off by building something to scratch an itch that you had. You, you were trying to satisfy a product need. You weren't necessarily trying to make a lot of money or... Yeah, they're all know. selfish needs. It's like we want to build something that helps our friends connect. No one's built it before, so we'll, we'll build it ourselves. And what was, what's your background been sort of training-wise? Did you get an MBA, or are you a coder, coder no, I, or a geek? I, was, um, I went to Syracuse as an undergrad, and I, I studied communications out of their new house school. Um, and so I'm not, I, I've never had any real formal tech training. Like, um, when I wanted to build the first version of the dodgeball stuff, I just sat down with a, with a book and learned you know, ASP and you know, Microsoft Access, and that was how a lot of this stuff was initially built. So you're a self-taught geek. Self-taught, yeah. And I went back to grad school at NYU at the ITP program. And okay. you know, that's not an engineering school. That's an, it's an art school. You know, but it's like art meets a little bit of product and a little bit of technology. And so you know, refine some skills there. 
I don't, it's not about being the best engineer. It's about you know just knowing enough to build the things that you you want to build, just to get to the prototype stage. Right. Um, and how did you meet your founders when you were first starting uh, the company? So, <clears throat> for Foursquare. Yeah. Um, well, first for Dodgeball, it was sure, with. Um, sorry. I'm sorry. It was with uh, you know my co-founder was Alex Reynard, just you know my my buddy in grad school. Like we did a whole bunch of projects together, and you know Dodgeball was a, just the next project that we worked on. Um, with Foursquare, I was actually working at another job. I, my uh, co-founder is Naveen Salvadurai. And uh, you know we were we were working. I was working at another startup. He was working at another startup. And as is common in New York, we were all crammed into one space, like two or three companies. And you know we sat two seats away from one another, and we both had similar ideas. I'm like, hey, let me try to build something, and then I'll integrate it with what you're building. Just you know, weekend projects. Um, and so yeah, that's that's how we connected. Oh. When your company was acquired, your first company was acquired by Google. And I guess maybe can you tell us a little bit about that experience? And you weren't at Google for very long. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, was there a reason why you decided that you wanted to leave Google and do another company or do something else? Sure. So we were we were at Google about two years. Like remember, we were coming right out of grad school, and um, uh, you know, we, I was trying to you know, Alex and I were trying to raise financing for for Dodgeball, and it was a really different time in New York. There wasn't a lot of you know angel investments for tech. Like all the angel money was coming from um, from finance guys, which we didn't think was like the right decision at the time. Um, and you know we, we were pitching big VC companies, and we were just we were two strap, like scrappy kids from this small program at NYU, and like they weren't willing to give us money. So we ended up, you know, we ended up at Google, um, you know, primarily because like, hey, we're interested in your ideas. We don't fund them, but we'd love to bring you guys in to work on it. So like we thought it was, you know, it was a great, it was a great exit for us at the time. Like we got to work on the project that we wanted to. Like Alex and I both had jobs and, and right. benefits at that point, and we had an office to work out of. Um, you know, but we were there for about two years, and we tried to make it work as best as we could. Um, and you know, for a number of different reasons, like, you know, some of it's timing, and I think some of it's like you know the New York office for San Francisco office. We just couldn't, you know, we couldn't make it work. So you know, I think one of the harder things that you know I think Alex and I have had to do in our careers is decide to leave dodgeball behind and move on to other things because it was still a product we were really passionate about. There was still enough users to make it interesting, and we just had to you know pack up and move on. Hmm. So Google has, you know, been fairly acquisitive. They've acquired a lot of companies, but one of their uh, traditions, I guess I would say, is it seems like they force the company to go through sort of restructuring a lot of things, and they have you shut down the company. You guys were kind of shut down for at least a little while, right? Well, we, um, you know, I, I, we were kind of a, an atypical acquisition just because, like, you know, we're, we were two people. So we, if anything, I think we were, we were too small to be to be noticed. You know, so we were, you know, working our way through some of the system, but you know, we were. Google works on the scale of hundreds of millions of users, and here we were with you know, 50,000 users, 100,000 users. So it wasn't a, right. a big blip on the radar. OK. And when you guys first were acquired, um, that was 2005, six? In 2005, yeah. 2005, OK. And so the, the startup environment and funding environment in New York is, you would say, pretty different from what it's like now? It seems like it's been changing in a positive way. Yeah, I, th people. I think it, it's radically different now. I mean, we, we had a hard time. Um, finding investors in New York back in 2000, in 2004, 2005, we, we just couldn't do it. Um, and this time around, it was it was a little bit easier. And I'd actually say that the um, that the scene is a lot different today than it was when we were trying to raise funds last year. There's a lot okay. of um, so even in a year, it's changed. Yeah, in, in yeah. New York. The New York scene has has heated up a lot in the last year. You know, there's you know 20, 25 different like really solid startups across a variety of spaces, but all kind of playing in this consumer internet space. And you guys, you guys raised capital from kind of one of the more well-known uh, funds out of New York, Union Square Ventures, yep. as, as well as also O'Reilly. Uh, yeah, O'Reilly Optech. And uh, did you also raise capital from angel investors? Yeah, we have um, we have ten different angels on the okay. uh, on the roster right now. Ten different angels. Ten right? different angels. Yeah. And why do why do you think it's important to raise both from angel investors and from VCs? And mm -hmm. is there a reason why you did one or the other? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is our first time doing venture financing, so we kind of just. You know, we were learning as we were going through it and making it up as we go along. Um, and so, you know, the structure that we started out with, which was, oh, we'll just get one investor and we'll raise, you know, half a million dollars, changed radically from the, you know, the structure we ended up with was two investors and about, you know, 1.35 million. And, you know, as we're going through and talking to different people, we're realizing that there's, you know, there's, there's more opportunities, there's different opportunities. Like, oh, we should get two funds because it makes it, you know, it, it diversifies the board a little bit. Oh, we should, uh, we should get angels because these are the folks that we're going to turn for, to for advice, you know, outside of the board. Okay. Uh, and it's, actually, it's worked out really, really well so far. When you, when you were getting started with Foursquare, um, by the way, if people in the audience want to ask questions or comment, if you want to tweet using hit BCN, I'll try and watch the tweet stream for questions. 
Um, when you guys were getting started with Foursquare, you were you were bootstrapping for the first nine months, right? You didn't take any outside investment. Yeah, it was just uh, you know sweat equity. You know, okay. Naveen and I working around my kitchen table. And then when you raised your first round of capital, you said you raised one point three million from yeah. uh, from those folks. Yep. And uh, and now, how many people are working for you, working with you at Foursquare? Yeah, now we're I think we're twenty five people. Twenty five. So yeah, you so guys we, are yeah, large, we went from larger from, startup. What's that? Larger startup already. Yeah, it's uh, it happened really happened really quickly. So even back in January, we were you know we were six people, and then we you know we start, we needed more bodies, so we started hiring really aggressively. Um, so twenty five people and only one point three million in. Capital that doesn't seem to add up there. It sounds like you're getting some money from other other well, sources. We're, we're spending it quicker than we than we were in the past. It's because there's a larger headcount. But we're, you know we're also doing you know some experiments in, in terms of monetizing Foursquare. Like we've done deals with big brands, and some of those end up uh, bringing in paychecks for the company. Uh, and we've just put that money back towards um, you know hiring and additional resources. When you're getting uh, a startup off the ground, like what are the resources you think are really important when you're first? Like building a product and then getting ready to go to market and then trying to scale up. Like, how did you go through your hiring structure in those in the last year and a half? Well, I think you know, first of all, it's, it, I think it's more important to focus on the product than the company. Okay. You know, um, Naveen and I just wanted to wanted to build things, and the company came second. Like, let's build a, a great product, and like, we, you know, everything from incorporating to taxes to the legal structure to like all that stuff came afterwards, and we actually ended up bringing in. You know, a general manager, this guy Evan Cohen, who's a rock star, to, to help us put a lot of this stuff together so we can still focus on the product. Um, wait, what was the other part of the question? Um, just like what was the resources and skills that you hired and oh, kind of oh, how, did, how did that progress when you were getting... getting yeah, involved? so I, I started off doing product and a little bit of engineering, even though I'm a lousy, a lousy coder. And Naveen was mostly building the, uh, the, you know, the, the clients, like the iPhone and the, and the API. Um, and then right away we brought in this guy named Harry, who was um, he's our first hire. Like the day that we, about you know a couple, about a month before we knew that we were going to get financing, I'm like Harry, we got to pull you out of Google, and you have to like this is wait. You, you have hired to him out of Google? Yeah, he was the guy that we worked with on, on Dodgeball. So, so we, did you have to wait to hire somebody out of Google because you were acquired? Was there any kind of no compete or anything? No, like? I don't think. I mean, because we left Google in '07 and we started this in '09, so okay. I, I don't think there's anything like that. Okay. Um, but you know, when we showed up at at um, when Alex and I showed up at, at Google with this, you know, code that we had written at NYU, like Harry was the guy that got stuck with rewriting it and turning it into Google code. And he ended up doing the same thing with Foursquare, taking my, you know, lousy PHP code and then, you know, turning it into something bullet -sweet. So your secret strategy in getting acquired <laughs> by Google was actually to go headhunting and recruiting for your next startup, right? Yeah. It's a, it, it, in retrospect, it might seem that way. No, I think we have like six people from Google now on the team. And it works, it's great because, like Google people are fantastic. Like they're super bright. I feel like Google's done all the vetting for us. And plus, you know, I think there's some benefit to like we all worked on the same company under the same culture for a while. Yeah. And you know, there's a little bit of like a shared language, or you know, we just kind of understand how the, how that company works. So, so Google is, uh, you know, at least talked of as being a very engineering focused culture. Uh, do you guys feel like Foursquare is also an engineering culture? I guess it depends on on who you ask. You know. Um, it's weird because I think we're in that stage of the company where the culture is starting to form a little bit, and the new, and, you know, the new hires pick it up from the from the existing hires, and the engineering team is is really super strong, and I'm sure they would think it's an engineering culture, right. you know, from the product side, like we're rah rah about the product all the time. So I think it depends on who you ask. So your first five hires were those all engineers, or were there any non-engineers in that group? They were all en all engineers, and the sixth one was uh, our general manager. And then let's next ten hires. What did those look like? Did you bring on any designers or any non-engineering types? Yeah, well, we have a, we have a full-time designer now. We like now we have um, three full-time biz dev people. Um, three full-time biz dev people. Biz dev people. Yeah, okay. well, just like business people in general, which is new. Like this, actually, that's starting on what's today? Today's Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Next, I think it's next Monday. Um, we, we're going to have two two additional biz dev folks, which is going to be big news for us. And I'm assuming those guys are sales focused and trying to get partners and other things in the door. Yeah. I mean, we're we're in this lucky position where we have a lot of um, you know business opportunities coming to us. We don't have to you know get on the phone and make cold calls. Um, and so a lot of it's just catching those opportunities and, and making the best of them. So did you guys, when you were first getting started, did you write any kind of business plan or anything like that to figure out, you know, how you're going to like plan out the company and get started? Not, not really. Um, you know, because again, it was all about like let's just build this product, and you know, we know interesting things will come out of it. Um, but you know, from doing the dodgeball stuff and from doing a lot of research and thinking about the space in general, like we have a general idea of how things are going to monetize, and we're starting to see that through a little bit now. What, what's your sort of philosophy around a lot of the lean startup customer development techniques? Do you think that that stuff's like valuable, or do you really just focus on, hey, we're building for ourselves and 
you know, we know kind of what we're going to be building there. Yeah, well, I, the roadmap is pretty well defined. You know, it's a lot of stuff that Alex and I were thinking about in grad school and then thinking about at Google and, um, you know, and it got modified when, you know, I, we, we teamed up with Naveen and, and, you know, Naveen and I started working on things. Um, so the roadmap goes, it goes out probably much longer than, you know, or much further than we can, po we can possibly build, you know. But along the way, you get distracted by things. Like, we didn't think we would be doing things for local merchants, but, you know, the big part of the business is going to be focused on those relationships. Like, we didn't think we'd be building things specifically for brands, but we're doing that too. So, like, we're kind of, you know, instead of going through this roadmap linearly, like, we're kind of zigzagging through it. But, um, you know, the, the, I think the whole point of the exercise is to build these things that have been in our heads for, you know, for five or seven or ten years. And, uh, you know, this seems like the best opportunity we have to build them. So a question from the tweet stream is, do you enjoy more sort of working with venture capital now, the second time around, than the first? Did you raise capital the first time around yeah, also? Yeah. Well, uh, oh, for Dodgeball? Yeah. Um, no, we tried to. Like, we went out and we pitched um, a bunch of firms in Silicon Valley down on, on Sand Hill Road. And, um, you know, we were just, we were two kids and they didn't, you know, that, that came out of this not even a business program at NYU. And, um, you know, I, they were writing big checks and we, it was pretty clear we weren't going to get one of them. Um, <laughs> so it, it, that, that, was, that was difficult. Um, and so we were just bootstrapping it, you know, but like with Foursquare, because, um, you know, we, I think we have a, a competitive advantage because we've, we've done this before and we know what the story looks like. And, but, you know, even when we were trying to raise funds back, uh, back in March, a year ago, like we had a hard time. It took us, you know, almost six months to raise our first round of financing because we were doing a startup that looks similar to, to Dodgeball. And people are like, well, that didn't work. How is this one going to work? You're still not going to be able to monetize it. And then as soon as we we've, we've found, uh, as as we found that connection between Foursquare and, hey, local merchants really want to use this to promote their businesses to their best customers, then you know, that's what started a lot of the, the, um, the conversations about, oh, my God, this is going to work in terms of monetizing, in terms of generating revenue. And I think that's when the, the conversations picked up. So, so let's dig in on this a little bit. I'm going to get a little tougher sure. here on the question. So, uh, you said that one of the issues was monetization. Uh, you know, post that I wrote, I definitely was suggesting, hey, like check-ins are kind of interesting for us geeks, and we do a lot of that stuff. But you know, is this really mainstream consumer behavior? And how come you aren't like doing a lot of reward functionality or other financial incentives? Like, tell me a little bit more about what you think the vision of the product is. Do you, are you guys going to start to offer more financial incentives? And do you feel like you've got a big enough? Biz dev team to go out and go after several million merchants around the U.S. and yeah, other places. So there's a couple of things. I mean, do you guys? Does anyone use Foursquare here? Do some people use it? Okay, that, that's awesome. Let's like we, I used to give these talks like like a year ago, and I I would just ask like, has anyone ever heard of it? And no one, no hands would go up. And I'd spend the whole time like talking about this is what we're doing. You know. And you didn't like hire a third of those people to come sit in the audience. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd see me afterwards for your checks. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, but so if you use Foursquare, you might have some sense of like what we're doing with, with local merchants, right? So people check into places, and you, you, know, you get credit for being there. So and why, do they, why do they check in? Well, Tell me, give me an example of why someone well, wouldn't check in. Like, it's, it's kind of like a poor man's tweet, right? So it's poor just, man's tweet. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a version of I'm here, like I'm out, I'm doing something. It's the same thing of like... And they're doing that because they want to meet up with, a, with a, a girl or a guy, or they're doing it because... You know, they might get, you know, something from the merchant or what's, what's, why do I want to do it other than just like, hey, maybe I'm a geek on, on Twitter? Yeah, well, I think there's a bunch of different reasons, right? It's like, why do people tweet about, you know, I'm about to go to the movies or, um, you know, I'm about to eat a sandwich or I'm eating this great sandwich right now? It's a, just a form of expression. Okay. And, you know, um, you know, when I think of those, like, what am I trying to communicate to my friends? I'm trying to, you know, communicate that I'm about to do something or I'm doing something interesting in hopes that it, I can meet up with real folks. So, I mean, I look at a lot of the social media stuff as, um, you know, like you spend a lot of time on, on Facebook, but what you really want to do is make that social graph interesting when you close the lid on your laptop and you go out into the real world. And I think that a big part of the Foursquare experiment is, is doing that. Like, how do you leverage a social graph in, you know, a really dense area like New York? We have a lot of people and places and things to do. And, you know, like, how do you really just build things that are supposed to make it easier to meet up with folks to discover new things. Right. But does that work if I don't live in a high-density urban area? Does it work if I'm a, you know, a grandmother in her 50s, maybe, who's not as savvy on this, you know, yeah. can't quite you know, read an iPhone as closely, maybe? Or, I, I, don't, I don't think it works yet, but I'm not convinced that it doesn't work. Right? So people looked at the you know, dodgeball stuff was always like hipsters drinking beers, and that, that, was, <laughs> that was a problem. And I think Foursquare, you know, Foursquare started off that way. And there's but at least 10 million of those, so that's that, yeah, still a yeah, pretty yeah, decent Yeah, so we market. still got a long way to go. <laughs> but, you know we, we see, you know, we see college kids using it to coordinate, you know, on campus. We see parents using it to coordinate play dates at playgrounds with their, with their kids. 
Um, and so just because you're, you know, we use the example like you check into bars and restaurants, but people check in everywhere. They check in at parks, they check in when they're in traffic, they check in when they're at conferences, they check in when they're at movies. Um, you know, it's just a way of sharing specifically what you're doing. And it's, it, right. you know, I think for some people, because it's all about location, it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a more useful filter in some ways. Okay, so let's presume for the moment that for some group of people, it is interesting to like sort of tell people where they're at and maybe use that to hook up. Mm -hmm. So why are you guys going to win that, you know, war for location versus, you know, other startup competitors like Gowalla or mm -hmm. Yelp or Looped or maybe larger companies like Facebook and Twitter who already have, you know, 50, 100 million, 500 million users yep. or more? Well, I, I think there's, there's a couple things there. Um, number one, we're just, you know, we're really, we're, the company is based around check-ins and based around location. Like, that's the one thing that we're doing right now, and it's the one thing that I think we're going to do better than everyone else. So um, do you really feel like that's a deep user experience that, you know, nobody else is going to figure out? Like, smart folks at Facebook and Google aren't going to, like, understand how that, how that works, too? No, I think, I think they'll get that, but because it's our, our core focus, right? So I think check-ins are ultimately going to become a, a commodity. And we've talked a lot about this before, where, you know, you'll see check-ins across all these apps. Like, there's, you know, 20 different competitors that are doing, you know, that have, like, almost like Foursquare knockoffs. And then you're starting to see, you know, Twitter's building in some location functionality. I wouldn't be surprised to see Facebook do it. Um, you know, but I think, you know, the experience that, that, that we've kind of created here, it's all about, like, what happens after you check in. Like, what's the incentive to check in? Like, the name of the game is not to get people to press the check in button. The name of the game is to create this experience that encourages people to want to check in. Like, right. are you introducing them to people that are nearby? Are you surfacing tips about what they should be doing, like, what they should be ordering while they're here? Are you creating some kind of, you know, sticky game mechanic that, that you know, enables people to compete with other folks in their neighborhoods and some of their friends? And so, like, we talk a lot about, like, this post-check-in screen. Like, what's the, what is the screen that you show to the user after you check in? And what of all the interesting things that you can do there? And that's the thing that we're really, we're really focused on. And I think that we're going to get that better than anyone else. And do you think that requires uh, financial incentives and capital to sort of, like, make that work? Or do you feel like you don't have to worry about those things and you can just build a great, great product experience and people will... I mean, finance, uh, capital for the business? Or? I mean, either. So, like, do users need financial incentives to really drive behavior? Do you need, you know, financial, you know, capital to sort of get merchants bought into what you're doing? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I don't think so. I think, like, we've, I think we've proven already that, you know, it's not, we, we do all this stuff, all this different stuff with Foursquare. So sometimes you check in, like, you know, people get it for the game mechanics. People use it to, you know, to get um, specials at local merchants. People use it to uncover tips nearby. And it's not that one of those things works. It's the combination of like all six of them, and every time you check in, it's like pulling the handle on a slot machine, and you, you don't know necessarily what, what you're going to get. I think it's right. it's that combination of things that, that really makes but, it work. But doesn't it worry you that you know, Facebook has 500 million users and mm -hmm. tons of capital. Google has tons of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Twitter even has got 100 million users these days. Sure. Isn't that daunting that you're sort of, you know, maybe you guys have got a million, two million users? Yeah, we're, like we're about 1.6. Okay, 1.6 uh, million. Yeah, so I mean, we're still, we're super small potatoes. Dude, you guys are a zit on the ass of Facebook right yeah, now. Yeah, that's exactly what we are, yeah. A really nice So, zit, like, though. it doesn't, like, scare the shit out of you that you're competing against this huge company with vast resources and lots and lots of users? Oh, I mean, of course it does, you know, but at the same time, like, we're... You don't you look know, very nervous right now. I you know, look we, very, yeah. very calm. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there's, there's a way for a lot of these services to exist, right? So I think there's, you know, if you look back to the decision that, not the decision, but like, um, you know, when, when Facebook was trying to get into Twitter space, being like, you know what, we're going to do status updates, we're going to do it just like Twitter, and everyone's like, this is it, Twitter's dead. Um, and Twitter's not dead, and, and you can probably argue that yeah, Twitter is stronger and more Facebook's been pretty successful with status updates, right? They have, but Twitter has been successful in their own right, you know? And so I think mm -hmm. as people try to get into the check-in game, it could, it could happen to us, right? Okay. But the, the opposite thing that, that could happen is that, you know, Facebook and Twitter teach people about the importance and the interesting things that come out of sharing location, and okay. that just drives more people to Foursquare. Okay, and maybe that also makes you an interesting acquisition target for other companies as well, perhaps? Yeah, it could be down the line, you know? Okay. But, it, like, you look, at the, you look at who you're against, it's like, just because, you know, we're at, you know, we're nearing 2 million users, and then the next player above us is, you know, Twitter at 100 million, it does a, there's a big gap there. And yeah. it, it, we can't look well, at it and just be like, oh, we're not 200, you know, we're not 100 million users, we should just hang it up, like, right. we should try our best to get there. So, how about the database of merchants and local, you know, sort of resources? Mm -hmm. uh, Yelp is maybe not at 100 million users, maybe they're at, like, somewhere between 20 to 50 million users. Mm -hmm. um, but they have a lot of local data, at least yeah. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like they have an advantage? They've added a check-in feature. Yeah, uh, yeah. They already mm -hmm. have lots of reviews and users and, you know, local resources mapped out. Yeah. Um, I mean, do we see them as a competitor, or...? 
Yeah, well, yeah, do you see them as a competitor? Uh, a little bit, like anyone in this space is, is really a competitor. But the thing is, like, you know, Yelp is, I think, about, they're about reviews, and they've fostered this community and this culture that's about, you know, reviewing your favorite restaurants, and that's, you know, people know what to use Yelp for. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that the check-in model works with Yelp because that's not how people have been anticipating right. that usage. And I think one of the benefits that we get is that, you know, we started from day one, it's all about check-ins, and it's the things that happen after you check-in, and it's the reason to check-in. Right. Um, and I think that's one of the things that that's puts us in a unique position. But, so, I mean, I think a lot of people sort of, you know, laugh at this little check-in model, and uh -huh. even though I've been critical, I think one of the things to recognize is, you know, local advertising in the U.S. alone is a 10 billion, tens of billions of dollars of market, mm -hmm. you know, opportunity. I think Yellow Pages business is close to $20 billion market opportunity in the U.S. alone. Uh, there's probably lots of other incentives and coupons and rewards. So there is a lot of money being spent on, you know, local advertising. Yeah. Uh, there is a reason for you guys to, you know, potentially be a very large business and for other people to be competing. Yep. Um, so given that there's all this money being spent there, don't you feel pressure to kind of like figure out ways to raise a lot of capital, get into the game of sort of, you know, acquiring that merchant database or acquiring the, the relationship with the merchant? Yeah. And isn't Yelp competitive in that they're also trying to get that relationship with that merchant. Yeah, I think that's, it's, it's not just Yelp, it's, it's Google too, and there's probably gonna be a couple other startups in that space that, you know, like, okay, well now that we're pushing, you know, users towards this mobile experience, it's really, you know, it's beneficial for these large companies to have these relationships with these local merchants. And so we're going after that too, right? But one of the things that we've been pretty successful is like aggressively crowdsourcing a lot of our data needs. And so, um, you know, if, if you've used Foursquare and like you try to check into a venue that doesn't exist, we ask you to create it and you can fill in the fields for the, the address and the zip code and the cross street and all these things. And, you know, people, people are doing that all around the world. We've got something like, you know, five million venues in the database right now. Right. Um, and, I, and what we're starting to see is like we've got these venues that are already, you know, hooked up to Foursquare and they're using, um, you know, they're using the venue specials to promote like, oh, if you're the mayor, you get a free cup of coffee. If you've been here, you know, 10 times, you get something else for free. Um, and you know, what we're seeing is that like, we're not out there making phone calls to these merchants. It's the users that are going into their favorite spots being like, hey, I'm a Foursquare user. I really like this product. Like, you, should, you should actively get involved. So in some sense, right. the users are turning into like, a, a mini sales force. And they're yeah. the ones that are converting the venues. And I think there's something really interesting and powerful there that, that's worth uh, experimenting. So, so that seems like a, an interesting competitive model to you know, the way that Yelp's going about getting out of business. Um, so another question from the tweet team is about Twitter and Facebook. Can you can interact for hours in the services? Mm -hmm. At the very least, Facebook there's really high, you know, user engagement. Yeah. Maybe from some of the social games that also are trying to incorporate, you know, sort of pseudo merchant like you know locations. Pretty high engagement. Generally on Foursquare, you sort of check in and then you go out. Yeah. Do you feel like you need to introduce more, you know, retention and engagement features to sort of be competitive there? Yeah, I, I think we could do that. Um, you know, it's like. One, one of the things we don't want to do is create more reasons for people to use their phones when they're out. Like this happens in New York all the time where we're sitting around at the table and everyone's texting each other instead of talking to each other. <laughs> and you know, that's, that's, not, that's not our fault, but people, you know, we do see people like checking Foursquare at, at, you know, instead of talking to friends, it's that, that's worrisome. But um, you know, I, we do want to create these experiences that are supposed to make you know, the real world a little bit easier to use by taking things from you know, existing social networks and the social graph and bringing them out to the real world. And so there's, there's lots of things we can do there. Everything from, you know, it's like we're starting to do it with the tips and the gaming mechanics and we might do it with, you know, sharing photos or, um, you know, contributing other types of data. Right. And do you think that Foursquare is generally a shared experience with people that you know or a discovery experience with people that you don't know as much? I think it can be a little bit of both. Like we've been talking for, for a while about how, you know, Facebook has this social graph which seems to be representative of everyone that you've ever, you know, every, you've ever met or shaken hands with. And Twitter has this social graph that seems to be representative of all the people that you find entertaining. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Foursquare social graph seems to be the people that you, know, you just like to meet up with in real life. Um, and I think that's great because it's all about sharing location. But you know, as I'm finding, like I was using Foursquare as I was walking around yesterday, and there's a lot of content that was left behind by people that I don't know. Um, that's really interesting. Like I was introduced to a couple like you know skate uh, skate spots, and someone pointed out some um, like left tips behind for where to see like interesting you know graffiti in Barcelona, and like that's those are interesting cases. They're not interesting to everyone, but they're interesting to me. 
Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'm not personally connected to those folks, but I think there's an opportunity for to Foursquare to connect those people based on shared interest. And that's one of the other things. We're, we're not doing that type of stuff yet. Right. And there's, a, I think, another big opportunity there. So, you know, there's a lot of been talk about how the Facebook model is kind of this binary friending activity and Twitter is more of an asymmetric follow model. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys also have, you know, your own social network layer, but then you're using both Facebook and Twitter. Um, you know, personally speaking, I get a little bit bummed out trying to, like, add, you know, several yeah. hundred friends on each network. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys see Facebook and Twitter as competitive in building that social graph, or are you planning to sort of, like, layer on top more? Yeah, we try to stuff layer like on top as much as we can, right? So the worst thing with, um, like, with, with building Dodgeball a bunch of years ago was that we had to recreate that social graph. Like, people, at, the, at that time, people were on, on Friendster. And so we basically had to build a mini version of Friendster to get to that point. Um, which is, it's just a pain in the ass because it requires a lot of work and you're maintaining something that you're really not passionate about. Um, you know, with, with Foursquare, we, we have the benefit of being able to, you know, oh, let's suck in your Twitter followers and we'll use that to pre-populate your social graph. Or let's use Facebook Connect, um, you know, to be able to, to, you know, populate a list of people that we think you're friends with. So and it what, makes it much, much easier. What do you think about the like buttons and Facebook and how they're handling privacy right now? Do you feel like, you know, in general that's a good thing for users or not such a good thing? The like buttons or what part of things? Uh, I mean, I guess the whole like buttons and the privacy model that they built, which basically isn't a privacy model, let's yeah. say it's more of a sharing model. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I haven't had a lot of issues with um, with my Facebook settings, so I haven't personally had some of the, the privacy concerns. I think what they're doing with the like buttons are really interesting. You know, it's a way to just scatter, you know, scatter your presence all around the web and enable you know people to always have a route back to Facebook. And so we, you know, we've done this on Foursquare. Like we've, we've added, you know, just experimenting to see how people use it, but all the venues have like buttons and people end up liking venues and maybe people end up liking tips and maybe people end up liking users. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how a lot of that stuff evolves and what we can actually end up doing with some of the data. So, ma'am, give me, uh, I don't want to say like, let's not predict the next five to 10 years, but can you predict, let's say the next 18 months, where do you guys, want to be in sort of competitive position with the respect to, you know, the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Googles and Yelps of the world. Like, what, what are the core set of issues that you want to kind of push towards solving for your users uh, and for merchants in the next 18 months? Yeah, so, I mean, we're, you know, we're really interested in, in focused on new user acquisition. Like, we, you know, we, we were talking about this before. Like, we're at uh, almost, you know, we're nearing 2 million users. We're at about 1.6 now, but we must, we have to be much, much bigger than Might that. Might be worth two zits on What's Facebook's that? Yeah, spot. yeah, exactly. So, you know, we got to get, we'll get to that point where we're 5 million users and 10 million users. And, you know, I, I don't know what the next milestone is after that. We'll, we'll figure it out once we get there. But I think once we hit that point, like, we're at a, you know, we're a player that's going to stay around for a while. Between, um, between new user acquisition and monetization, what keeps you up at night more? I think it's the it's the new user acquisition. It's, it's not not even your new user acquisition. It's more like there's so many things that we want to build into the product that we're you know we're struggling to do just because like we're growing so quickly that it raises scaling problems. Like do you guys remember the early days of Twitter where you know they had the a hard early time? days of Twitter? I think the early days of Twitter are still here. Yeah, yeah. But I mean like before <laughs> like when it would it would be down for how many like, how many people had Twitter was down like all last night couldn't tweet because of uh, oh was it. Well, I think no, I World Cup is uh, oh, bringing yeah, yeah. Twitter back to the world of uptime as a new event for uh, for Twitter again. Yeah, I mean we have, you know, I don't want to say we have similar problems, but we can, you know, we can see that we we need to um, grow in a certain way to protect against those types of events, and that that keeps us busy. That keeps our engineering team really busy. You know, we were rolling out features much quicker in January when you know we were half a million users, and now it's uh, you know it gets a little bit harder. So the things that stress me out are that we're not. You know, there, we have so much that we want to build, and like we're all excited about building it. We just have to find, you know, find time to do it. And that's and what you know. It's a, you, you hire more people to do that, so that, right. that's part of the. You know, and the how do you see your role changing as a founder and CEO of a company that's you know two people to ten people to twenty five, and now I don't know. Maybe in the next year, you think you'll double the size of the company? Gosh, I, I don't know. You know, do um, <laughs> you think you'll still be CEO a year from now? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> um, I want. I still want to. I like this job. It's fun. Um, so it's. Uh, you know. I didn't think that we'd be twenty. You know. I never thought we'd be twenty-five people. You know. I mean. It, someone asked me last year, like, how many users are you going to have at the beginning of you know two thousand ten? I said thirty thousand, and we were like, no, it's you know, it's like a million. Um, and so I'm. I've been kind of bad at making guesses about how quickly we're going to grow. You know. I think we're we're thinking we we're you know we're twenty-five people now. We'll probably be maybe 30 at the end of the year. Like, we just got some new office space, so we've got more room for people, which is great. Um, but, you know, a, a, the thing we're really focused on is just this roadmap. Like, we've had these things in our heads that we've wanted to build. Like, collectively, the whole, 
the whole company. Um, you know, everyone that we brought in has has had a little project that they've been tinkering on on the side, and these are like projects that are supposed to make cities easier to use, or you know, share restaurant reviews, or meet up with friends, and like the whole. You're talking about company culture, like it's this hacker culture of just these are things that we want to build. Let's just do whatever we have to do to get them built, um, and it seems to be working out so far. So, how about uh, the non U.S. Uh, non-English speaking world of mm -hmm. Foursquare. Uh, we were actually kind of coming up here and I think we found out that there's a Foursquare meetup somewhere in Barcelona uh, yeah, later yeah. today. Which I'm very surprised about. Where was it? <laughs> Does anyone know where that is? Where is it? At uh, the Plaza Catalonia? Yeah. yeah. At 8 p.m. So, Thank you. So, uh, is Dennis going to make a surprise appearance? I, well, I have to. I, okay. I'd love to. Well, I guess it's not a surprise excited. appearance yeah. now. So. Well, so I knew there was some kind of meetup going on, but I didn't realize it was going to be someone said like, like 30 people. That's, that's great. I'm psyched. Um, wait, what was the question? So, <laughs> any, uh, so uh, does the rest of the world matter? Is the US oh, yeah, yeah. the only so thing? People look at, at Foursquare and like, oh, you guys, it's, all, it's all people in New York and San Francisco. It's like, no, there's, you know, it's 40% it's of the activity is, uh, is outside of the US. And we find about 20% uh, of the activity overall is, is in Europe. Um, and so you know, we need to do things like, uh, you know, I, I, feel st I, I think the product feels a little bit too New York. You know, we need to translate into different languages. We need to so have specific gaming I, mechanics for specific countries. I was just in Tokyo. I heard a, a rumor from the, some SoftBank folks that uh, Shibuya, which mm -hmm. is a neighborhood uh, area, popular area in Japan, is the most checked in place on the planet. Uh, that, that is true. I don't know if it's still true, but it, uh, it, it was true at a certain point in time. And you guys, you guys aren't doing anything particular to support Japanese, are you? We're not doing anything. You know, it's it's weird. Like we have, we're, we've we've picked up like really passionate communities of users all around the world, and in places where, you know, we don't even have any friends, which is really exciting. It's like people just started <laughs> using it and spreading it organically, and that's really that's really great. So, uh, do you have any uh, particular awards for mayors in Barcelona that you're gonna like uh, roll out later today? You no, know, I think if I had a little bit more time, I would have thought about it and made something awesome for the conference. But we've been hustling at 100 miles per hour for. Can you, can you like call six some weeks. folks back in New York and like set up a special badge <laughs> if, for Barcelona? If, if I called them and asked them, they would come over here and hit me. <laughs> like we're now. <laughs> like what, how do the how does the company change from like six to 25 people like we're at that point where we have we have process now you know so we don't just like willy-nilly make badges for like our friends birthday parties like we have a system in place and we have okay. systems for all sorts so of things. so you're too important to have fun now it sounds like no, right? no 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 we still we still manage to have fun it's just uh we have to make sure that we're not stressing out the engineers all the time so i know you probably can't answer this question but it was rumored that uh yahoo offered you guys a hundred million dollars or or some such to uh, buy out the company, we d we have talked to partners about potential um, acquisition offers. We don't necessarily comment on a lot of these things, but we so 120 to million, 130 uh, million. I can't disclose that. Okay. <laughs> right, but you know, like some number there, you probably would consider that uh, more seriously. Well, we got to think about um, you know, like well, this chair makes weird noises when I move, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got to think like, about what's what's best for the the product. You know, like we've. Um, you know, I've been through this experience with, with, uh, with the dodgeball stuff. So, so I know the right answer is it's all about our users, it's all about the product. But seriously, like, you've got to, like, that's got to be a serious decision for you to consider when you might you know, walk away from a transaction like that with 10, 20, 30 million dollars. Like, mm. OK, so the, the, the answer is, like, listen, we went through this with, with Google and we brought it there. And it wasn't, you know, the Google acquisition wasn't a ton of, ton of money. Um, it, was, you know, it, was, it was good for us coming out of grad school, but it's not a, a huge acquisition like people are yeah. speculating. But this might be life-changing money. It, it In could, Silicon Valley, we call that fuck you money. I know, I know. But, uh, so, so listen, we, we did, we were, uh, when, the, when the dodgeball stuff was taken away from, from us, and like, we had to leave it behind, and to leave the thing that I felt like most passionate about and the user community I was really passionate about, that was, I think, the worst thing, I, like, one of the worst things I've had to do like, in my career. And I went into like, this funk afterwards for like two years. I'm like, this is what I've been working on forever. This is the project that I loved, and this is the, you know, this is this is the stuff that I love doing. I didn't have that sure. anymore. And you know, Foursquare is like another chance to do some of that. And it's at some point, it's not about the the money. It's about just doing the stuff that you want to do. Like if this one doesn't work out, we're gonna have to do another one. You know, and it's a lot of work to get from <laughs> zero to a million users. And it's like it's a real pain in the ass. And I don't okay. necessarily want to do it again just to build the same ideas on top. All right. So. Take some of that next round financing off the table, dude. Definitely. <laughs> Be worth it. Uh, any last thoughts or words for where the future of all this social networking stuff is going and check-ins? Uh, I, you know, I feel like we're, we're in a fortunate position that we're kind of making up the future as we go. Um, you know, I feel like we did that with some of the dodgeball stuff, and we're doing it again with Foursquare. And you know, we happen to be 
we're really at the, like, the timing's really bright right now. Like, people understand, you know, first of all, everyone has, you know, a lot of people have smartphones with GPS. A lot of people know that they, you know, you use apps Actually, for these particular how cases. About, how about Android versus uh, iPhone? So you guys planning to do a lot on that platform? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing, you know, I think we just hit our 250,000 Android download like a week ago. Okay. And so Android is, is catching up with iPhone in terms of, in terms of usage. Um, and we, we know BlackBerry's got a big percentage too. But um, you know, we're, we're in this interesting spot where like the phones are, you know, not only the phones smart, but the phones are getting smarter. Like the Android devices potentially know um, where they are when they're not necessarily turned on. And the iPhone 4.0 is going to get some of that functionality also, like to do this background location tracking. Um, so there's interesting things. Like you could be just walking down the street and a Foursquare message pops up. It's like, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's near lunchtime. You haven't eaten yet. And <laughs> this is the place that your buddy recommended. You should stop in and get a sandwich. Um, and those are, I, I, I'm not sure if those are the best ideas, but those are, those are interesting things that we've been thinking about for, you know, 10 years. And now finally we have the, you know, we have the platform and we have the users and we have the engineering team and everyone has the phones and we can kind of push these ideas out there and see if they work. And I think that's the, that's the most exciting part of it all. So mission statement for Foursquare is serendipitous discovery of a great ham sandwich. That's it. As long as people are digging their sandwiches, our, our work here is done. All right. Thanks, Dennis. Cool. Appreciate Thank the you guys for uh, chat. Me. Appreciate it. Thank you.